All right, thank you very much. I'm John Biggs. Uh, this is how venture capital and private equity firms use external data. I'm glad all these seats are open because it's going to get wet up here. <laughs> uh, we do a full Gallagher routine. I don't know if you guys remember Gallagher. Um, it's going to be awful, ultimately, but I think we're going to survive. Uh, <laughs> welcome. Sorry for ruining your opening. <laughs> Better opening than we have. Yeah, it works for me. All right, uh, let's run down the uh, line. Rebecca, uh, introduce yourself, tell us your story. Sure. So Rebecca Yu uh, spent last eight years in public and private markets. Current gig is uh, at Bell Health Investment Partners. We are a private uh, equity investment firm focused in the healthcare space, uh, managing about $500 million in total assets and uh, 12 people based in New York, but investing across the states as well. Um, what's different about us is, uh, you know, we uh, partner with founder-led, uh, founder-owned businesses, end up being the first um, tranche of institutional capital goes in uh, and help these companies grow over a four to five year uh, hold period, uh, both across organic and inorganic strategies. Uh, spent a lot of time in M&A uh, looking at fragmented end markets as well. Okay. Uh, so I'm at Body. Uh, I'm with 500 Startups. So started my career there uh, on the legal side, uh, running our transactions in North America, South America, uh, everywhere but Asia, pretty much. Um, and so now uh, we're primarily a, a pre-seed and seed stage uh, venture fund. Um, we are very globally focused. So uh, we've now invested in about 75 countries. Um, and about 120 people, half outside the US at this point, um, kind of spread throughout the globe. So uh, not, a partic not, a, not an area we like to think that we haven't invested in before or at least explored. Um, so uh, now I primarily focus on uh, our San Francisco Accelerator program. So we invest in companies um, at a very early stage, uh, kind of we like to think of it as the first institutional check is a very different definition yeah. depending on how you look at it. But uh, uh, usually uh, we look at companies where they've only had like angels, friends and family before we come in. Yeah, I'm Alessio, I'm a suite for five ventures. We're early stage fund here in New York. We invest state to series A, primarily focus enterprise SaaS, uh, but we do select consumer deals. Um, I lead our engineering team. So that kind of ranges from, you know, all the data work to the actual tools that we build both internally and externally. Uh, so we actually use our engineering team to build tools for founders, uh, kind of, you know, teach them how do you kind of think about dilution, how do you think about market sizing. Um, I was on the operating side before that, um, different roles on the engineering side. And now, yeah, decided to bring my talents to venture capital, as LeBron would say. <laughs> All right, super. So I used to be at TechCrunch, and now I'm at Coindesk, uh, two organizations that still exist. Um, so my question is this, when I was over at TechCrunch, the whole idea of VC was it was the gut feeling of a, found, of a maybe a former operator who knew exactly what they wanted and there was none of the, it was very, very Silicon Valley, the TV show, uh, where nobody was looking at data, nobody was using data. Uh, has that changed at all? Do you still have this gut, gut feeling folks who are running around trying to figure out what to invest in? Um, I don't know if you want to go first go, here. Go first. Uh, I think there's definitely still an element of that going on. Um, 500 startups is that, basically. I mean, like, to, to a certain to degree. You guys give to money. A, yeah, to a certain degree, uh, I don't think that can go away at the stage we invest at. Um, I think that's what makes the alternative data thing really interesting is that um, you know, the data we're working with from these companies sometimes, like the joke is always what garbage in, garbage out. Like You can't really run any sort of like sophisticated analysis on a company where um, you know, if they have six months of data, what does that really tell you about anything? Um, especially if the first three months were like beta and whatnot. Um, so I think there's still a ton of emphasis put on the gut feel and this team has a great background, so I'll back them um, kind of thing. But I think there's a lot more attention paid to market sizing in a way that actually makes sense um, and making comparisons to like later stage private companies or even public company comparables to be like, what is the ultimate possibility that this company has, because I think it's tempting with those kinds of companies to invest in just fun consumer businesses, <laughs> which I think is a lot of where that Silicon Valley stuff happens. Alessio, Rebecca? Yeah. 
Yeah, I think like the real thing about venture capital is that like the feedback cycle is so long. So it kind of takes five to 10 years to understand whether or not you were like driven in the right or wrong way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you see a lot of changes in using data and kind of software to help with like accountability. So when you look at a deal, you make certain decision, you decide to invest or not. But like in three to four years, when the company goes to zero, like can you actually inform yourself on like why you made that decision? Uh, and I think a lot of people now are kind of reckoning with that. They're like, mm -hmm. oh, I thought this was a good deal because everybody else did, but yeah. I didn't really, you know? So I think that's kind of like where the industry is going to go. I think a lot of it is still going to be gut driven. You know, you see companies coming out of YC with like a couple of people in a dream that get funded and then end up doing really well. Some don't, you know? So part of it is still there, but in a more structured way, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So we're a private equity. So um, I think just from a access scale availability of data perspective, we have a lot more. And I'd say, you know, we spent a lot of time looking at that. So maybe a little bit of a different approach on what you guys think about. That said, I do think fundamentally to, for us to invest in a company, we do have to focus on what the growth levers and what we need to believe going forward. And there is some element of prediction in that too. And so uh, it is a combination then of past performance, looking at historicals and needing to believe more often than not that something has changed or will change for us to really do, uh, believe in how we can actually be the best partners as investors for this particular company versus others. So to your point, John, there is, it's a combination. Mm -hmm. There's definitely this, this aspect of understanding there's analysis and data going behind it, but the future is, is the future and there is a feel of how do you feel good about um, uh, driving that change. So maybe you can start, how do you, how do you use data to surface new deals? How do you use data to surface new investments? Yeah, I think there's like a lot of different ways. It depends kind of like what, what stage we're looking at. So since we invest kind of like pre-seed to series A, there's like very different sourcing strategy. Uh, and we're really pioneering what we call outbound driven sourcing at the seed stage. Uh, so one thing on the early side can kind of be, you know, M&A activity that leads to employees departing. So, you know, one of the founders that we backed recently, Raffaele, was the CIO of Dua Security, which was acquired by Cisco for two and a half billion. So when the acquisition went through, we started tracking all the kind of like senior management uh, at Do, and we're like, these people probably do not want to work at Cisco, you know, like no disrespect. Uh, <laughs> and that's kind of like one way at the, at the pre-seed, at the kind of like growth seed series A, we're gonna start looking more at like, you know, what's, what's the buzz around it? Like what are like the logos on company's website? Uh, if a company gets posted, you know, on product con, like are the people commenting potential buyers uh, of the product? Like is there actual traction in the sentiment on analysis uh, versus just being, you know, individual contributors that might think a tool is cool, but like the person that actually has to buy it doesn't see much value into it. Um, so we look at a lot of different data sources. Uh, I think the most important thing is kind of like layering all on top of each other. So you cannot really look at like data sets in a vacuum. Like if you just look at product hunt, you really lack the information about, oh, this company is getting good reviews, but like they've already been backed at the seed by like Excel or like Kleiner. So like the chances that the deal is actually like high likelihood for you to do is like very low. Um, so I think that's something that we keep kind of like informing ourselves on, kind of like what are some signals that can predict whether or not this company could be a fit for us or not. Uh, and at the end of the day, still a lot of like manual work once you source the company, because unlike, you know, uh, public public equity is like, you cannot really like buy at any moment and you cannot sell at any moment. So you have to be there when the round is happening. And once the round is closed, you're either in it or you're not. And then you kind of have to inform your strategy uh, accordingly. You cannot buy the day after when the market reopens. Uh, so it creates a lot of nuances in how you source them. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think sourcing for us, I don't know how much, uh, we're able to use data tools to, to do sourcing, but uh, I completely agree with the, you know, uh, especially the, this new wave of IPOs that's happened. There's a huge amount of, of talent leaving these big, big uh, companies that we, you know, we wouldn't call startups anymore, but your, you know, your Airbnbs, your Ubers, your Dropbox, your uh, Pinterest, all of these, like we see all of the employees making their own syndicates for, angel investing and so a lot of deals we see now come from these syndicates of employees from these huge companies that um, will see kind of the first few people that are going out and starting their next company. Um, so that's an interesting area that we've gotten some deals from but otherwise because we're so early on I mean uh, we have the luxury of kind of running an accelerator program so a lot of deals come to us so for us we use the data much more so 
to validate, is this a real opportunity? Um, as opposed to having like a specific tool that helps us sh source something. Um, because if it's already bubbled up onto some kind of data tool, it's probably too late for us, at least. That's interesting you say that. Um, so we, um, we're a little bit more thesis driven as well. And so for us, there's two components of using data. It's part one around um, being able to develop with thesis and understanding what's a good market to be in. You know, take home health, for example, you understand sort of aging population, uh, you have more people wanting to age in place at home. These are trends that from a macro uh, perspective, you can actually tell from the data. And, and from that perspective, then we're able to say, look, this is a market that, that we wanna be in, and this is a sector that we wanna be in. And so that, I think, has a little bit more of a data analysis driven behind it too. Just understand a high level, you know, healthcare, not all healthcare subsectors are created equal. This one, probably more interesting than some of the others out there. And then part two, you know, we actually do spend a lot of time using some of the data tools that we have access to, to really go then say, home health, interesting, what are the keywords here that will lead us to companies, whether it's a particular geography, whether it's a particular business model. And so we're able to, through Google and some other uh, tools that have been built out as well, uh, find email address, uh, addresses, find conferences, find ways to reach out to these particular founders and entrepreneurs that we can then have conversations with, lead to first meetings with, um, assess whether or not it's a good business, and eventually end up investing in, in them as well. So this is uh, something I've been thinking about as well. Is, is there a way to, given the current data sets, given even alternative data that you guys are looking at, we can talk about that in a second, is there a way to automate what you guys do? Uh, if not, what would we need uh, to make it almost completely, I don't know, software sentient kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I recently wrote a blog post about this kind of like how machine learning is gonna ill fit for early stage venture. I think like the main piece of it is like there's asymmetrical, asymmetrical access to data. So like, unlike the, the public markets, you don't have access to all the data all the time. So like, you can kind of like surface some signals, but it's hard to like do like capital as a service, you know, because like you're never gonna be able to have the full uh, look into it. And also like once you get the data, you know, some people look at revenue as like net revenue, some people look at it in gross revenue. So especially at the early stage when you don't really have like a CFO, it's hard to like automate. Uh, but I think w what we do internally is kind of like automatically pull in all the data, automatically stack rank the companies and never really hide them because, you know, you know, machine learning, all these current systems are kind of like backward looking. So you never really know like what the company of the future looks like and it's probably not gonna look like the previous ones. But what you wanna do is kind of like, there's certain signals that are, you know, pretty good indicators. So like if a technical team uh, is going after a, a comp, you know, market in infrastructure, like security, that's probably a good fit. If, if it's going after it without a technical team, it's probably not a good fit. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the end of the day, I think automation is a very long, long way. I mean, we cannot even get like Alexa to work properly, <laughs> you know, let alone deploy like hundreds of millions. Uh, I, I don't think our LPs. We replace Alexa with though. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't know. But. Yeah, uh, I, I tend to agree where we, we've tried to use a number of like specifically AI tools for analyzing a founder, analyzing the revenue, like modeling growth, but um, it's just so hard with data that's not, especially, I, I love that you mentioned like, they don't even necessarily know if it's net revenue or if it's GMB or whatever, like they, uh, especially for an early, early stage company, um, you're gonna have to do a lot of manual work to make sure what you're putting in is even right. Um, and then on top of that, uh, I think the gut feel part we talked about earlier is like, especially at the early stages, uh, you really can't replace because there's just not enough uh, statistically significant things that you can use at that point. But I do think uh, automating how you do analyze and make comparables and do things like that, like those tools are 100% useful and widely used and people still need them. I think there are VCs that think they're above that, that think that like, oh, but I just have this grand vision and I can see markets developing. Um, I think that kind of practice is, is slowly, slowly gonna turn into a more data-driven um, investing mindset, but I think there's still uh, a long ways to go. So you're saying that we'll still have a job in five to 10 years? <laughs> yeah, one would hope. Um, but uh, especially at the early stages, I think. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I think there's, there's a component of getting to a place where we can make data more efficient and we can definitely use that as a, 
uh, as a way to sort of replace some of the manual work we do, but the full automation is, is hard. I think unless you your point around making data in, in, in a structured form that we could then have it be a comparable across all the different potential investments that you make, that's hard. I think the other component for us is specifically around some of the KPIs that we'll look for in terms of whether or not to invest in a company, they go beyond the financial metrics too. So even identifying what those KPIs should be and having that variability across different investment themes we have, is, it's hard to, to, to then automate without actually doing the, the intellectual thought and analysis behind it as well. But definitely helpful is, you know, I think home health, again, if we go back to that example, you know, once we know certain key metrics in terms of, you know, turnover rate for some of the, the employment, um, you know, number of patients, you know, per referral source, some of these key metrics there, if you're able to then pull that data in some way, um, and actually convince the, the company to deliver to you if they track it to, to the extent they do, um, could make it much easier for us to do our jobs. But it is sort of a two-way conversation, us as investors wanting it and, and, and the companies being able to produce that data as well. I think what you said about revenue and, and those financial figures not being the main driver sometimes is, yeah. is also part of why everything can't be automated because um, it's not always gonna be the most important thing uh, if you're making a more market bet or a future bet, especially because you have the luxury of the 10-year time horizon that public investors have to you know, hit certain goals way quicker, but um, we have the luxury of being able to wait something out. <laughs> Tell me a story about um, finding some unique information that helped or hindered an investment, uh, a data source that you may not have uh, expected to see or expected to access. You mean like to find, to source? Yeah, yeah to source or to, uh, to figure out if you're gonna do a bridge round or whatever else. Mm -hmm. huh. Maybe that never happened. Um, I don't know that it's going to be that groundbreaking or new, but I yeah. think even things as basic as like reviews, yeah. just parsing reviews of a, like that a company has, especially if they have a product where people can leave reviews, um, not something that you would initially kind of very early be looking at, but just looking through product reviews if they have lots of different places. Um, is really insightful to kind of help you with that gut feel part of things. Mm -hmm. um, because we can go and do all the other analysis and be like, oh, things look promising. But then you go and find a bunch of reviews that have like all these problematic portions in there where, um, you know, the entrepreneur is always going to present things as the rosiest possible picture. And um, a lot of people are not selling vaporware, but things that are, you know, on the back end, not, maybe not fully built. Um, and so when you see uh, how far off that is through something like reviews, I think uh, that can definitely change the perception. I'll give, I'll give you an example, even though we didn't end up getting the deal. Um, so a while ago, I started this company called Tandem um, and kind of chatted with the founders via email. You know, they're like, we're not really raising right now, okay? Uh, then they're posting the product on Product Hunt and our software picked it up. And the person who posted was Gustav, who's a partner at Y Combinator. So the software was like, hey, this person is in your network and like posted this deal. So I'm like, from that information, I can like infer that like, okay, this company is not raising because they just got into Y Combinator. So this deal is gonna be like super hot. So we need to like get in front of it. Um, but we didn't end up being able to do that. You know, YC is very strict with it. Um, they ended up raising uh, seven and a half million from Andreessen uh, before demo day. Um, but that's kind of one where, you know, it's kind of like data that is not really related to the company at all, actually, but it kind of gives you a little insight uh, into the dynamics of the round uh, that can be helpful in kind of like thinking about timing and prioritization uh, and all that. Yeah. yeah, I think they're just going back to your point, the reviews have really helped us, uh, mostly because a lot of the companies that we invest in, the, the biggest asset is really just the people behind it too. And so less, I think, on, on Yelp per se, but if you go to Glassdoor, you go to LinkedIn, you look at yep. the employee turnover, you look at comments around the CEO and the management that they might not show you in a meeting because they want something from you, but they, they could treat their employees differently. I think some of that ends up, you know, again, tying to a little bit of the gut feel. Um, we've actually walked away from deals where we felt uncomfortable with management teams that don't show well um, outside of, of formal meetings that are prepared as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the, because the team aspect of it, in order to become like a billion dollar company or whatever it is, um, they're gonna have to attract and retain people in some of the most competitive markets. And you know, if they're terrible to work with, 
they're never ever going to grow to that size or retain good people to do that. And and so that kind of thing, we're we're seeing if somebody's a good manager or a good leader, and people actually feel that on the other side, not just your own perception of meeting them in their best possible light. Um, I think that's been a huge deciding factor for us for, for a number of deals. So you guys have been talking a lot about people, um, which is fine. Uh, they're nice sometimes. The <laughs> so in the world of crypto, uh, especially over at Coindesk, we're talking to a lot of companies that essentially want to be completely transparent and show you all the dials and levers and things. And to a degree, the, the, it's robots paying robots or robots interacting with robots. And some of the founders are actually very robotic. Um, but the human aspect of that seems like it would be going away, especially if we're talking about a DAO, especially if we're talking about a distributed investment system, uh, that sort of thing. Almost like crowdfunding, but the robots make the choices. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is where do you see that headed, um, especially as you see companies that aren't quite uh, fun consumer plays, like, I don't know, a Jetpack or something like that, but instead they're building uh, fundamental aspects of trading, investment, uh, internet connectivity, uh, all that other good stuff. Because it seems like we're flipping into an entirely new era of a new backbone, right? Uh, there's a lot here for six minutes, but I'm not sure if you guys had any experience in seeing that, and, uh, and are you expecting to see a completely transparent organization like that down the line? Yeah, I think that's gonna be very impactful as like a lot of the success stories of like people becoming millionaires from like Lyft, for example, kind of come out. It's gonna like, there's gonna be more and more accountability like inside companies of like, how do you like, what are like my stock options actually worth? Mm -hmm. You know, like, are, are the founders raising money and like doing all these things like good for me? You know, like we work is kind of like another good example, you know, like, you feel like very good when you have like we work stock options mm -hmm. when the IPO gets announced and then like you're gonna keep moving forward. And it's like, oh, I didn't even know all these things existed. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, kind of like corporate governance, transparency uh, is gonna be something that even at the earlier stage you kind of start seeing. I think like the private companies staying private longer is kind of like mm -hmm. giving them more free reign on like how they organize the board, how do they like structure all these things. but. I think employees are gonna be more aware of kind of like what the pitfalls of it are. You know, there's like a lot of people that their options are now like worth zero. They probably feel very bad about it. As investors, like what we can do is really, you know, make sure that we protect the employees as much as the founders. I think that's kind of like one of the learnings that we've seen as a company kind of scale up to two, 300 uh, employees. You really need to be like a very good leader and like very good at like retaining talent because if not, you just cannot do it, especially if you're like in non-prime markets, so to speak, kind of like San Francisco, New York, like we have fiscal note uh, down in Washington, they're like 300 employees. Uh, there's not like a super deep pool of tech talent there, but they've been able to like retain it because it's such a good organization. Um, but you know, kind of like a seed series A investors, there's only a limited amount of things that we can do, but kind of like, I don't know, at the later stage, uh, what you see in that. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I think for us, you know, corporate governance is always, it's a it's a big focus, um, and and you know, especially as we make investments as well, um, something that that we care about when we're negotiating fee terms and, and everything else in between as well. Um, you know, I think what makes it complicated is that everyone is motivated by something different as well. The founder, the tier two management team, and then I think especially, you know, healthcare fundamentally is also about being able to provide services. So you have a lot of people who are sort of day to day, and you know, they wouldn't care or, or even want to ask about, you know, corporate governance as well. They just want to come to, to, to their work and, and their concerns are, you know, do I get paid? Do I keep, get paid on time? Do I have enough money to, to make rent? And so very different concerns as we think about, you know, how do you really keep the wheels on moving in, in the same direction as well? And so I think, you know, it's Lana, as a shirt to, to your question and, and how you think about it, it really depends on what sort of company it is. You know, there's some companies that we have that are a little bit IP heavy that have a little bit more of the, the uh, the, the, the founders and the highly motivated um, you know, employees that really care and understand options and, and want a whole package and, 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 and understand you know, what, what they're signing up for as, as a mission. Um, and you know, we, we try to structure something around governance that works for them from, from that perspective. And there are others that are on the other end of the spectrum, to your point, which is you know, 1,000 employees, 800 of which are you know, working at minimum wage or maybe a little bit you know, above that, and all they care about is making sure they have a job. 
And that's just a very different model when you have you know, a, a founder that is running that sort of business as well. Um, I think on the corporate governance side, I think there's, there's, there's kind of two, not just to be a little bit of a devil's advocate here. I think uh, especially at the early, early stages that we deal with sometimes, um, people take money from angels or groups that are like maybe not that experienced with corporate governance or even uh, an early stage technology company and they might not be the best place to be making board votes and things like that. And so if you move to this era of like everything is like a blockchain where based on their ownership they get to like hold something up or not reach a consensus, uh, I think that's problematic for like the speed of innovation that a pre-seed company needs to move at. Because sometimes we've seen companies not necessarily die, but almost die, actually definitely die, because they can't get a vote passed through some board structure that they created when they were like massively inexperienced in setting up the company. Um, and it could be a good company, it could be a good idea, but if they like are locked into this corporate governance structure that's for a much later type of company, um, and those investors are making demands of certain sorts, and they're not experienced in what a company like that looks like, I think it kills companies sometimes. Um, that being said, you give the founder too much trust and free reign, and you end up with lots of the very public s scenarios that we've all read about in TechCrunch. <laughs> mm -hmm. are, the, are the only two op options uh, completely transparent and completely controlled by a quote unquote crowd of investors and the single founder powering through? I mean, I, I think there's definitely a happy medium ground. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think there's legal options you can use with protective provisions and things like that. But also, um, I mean, I think having good, I think that's always the case that people try to make of you want the smart money or the good investors in the room. So I think um, that's one of those things where founders have to be smart about who they're partnering with. Um, and I think then they won't have these problems. Uh, because I think the transparency is super important. Uh, and on the investor side, especially because our portfolio is now 2,300 companies or so, like, uh, you know, we've seen our fair share of where that single founder driven, they do what they want uh, and badly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the other thing I would add, at least for, for us, is that it also helps to, to create different boards for different purposes. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of companies that, that we've looked at and, and one or two of our portfolio companies that actually have a, a medical board. And those are the people that are medically oriented, have a clinical background and can help med make medical decisions. But they don't have access and nor do they want access to be making the, the actual governance decisions on you know, revenue, budgeting, mm -hmm. everything audit committee or compensation committee would do. And then we would have a separate board that would take care of that aspect of it too. And so being able to sort of bifurcate what people are good at and what the board and the key decision makers are uh, there to make and, and define that decision has helped move those decisions to be faster and also create competencies at the right place as well. All right, super, I think that's about it. Uh, thanks for watching, thanks. <laughs>